union. You created us for yourself, so that our hearts are restless until they find rest in you. Grant to us such piety of heart and strength of purpose that no selfish passion may hinder us from knowing your will and no weakness from doing it. In your life, may we see life clearly and in your service find perfect freedom. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You may be seated.
84. Uh -huh. And now it's on page 804. Uh -huh. Heavens, even 
even the highest heaven cannot contain you. How much less this temple I have built. Yet give attention to your servant's prayer and his plea for mercy, Lord my God. Hear the cry and the prayer that your servant is praying in your presence this day. May your eyes be open toward this temple night and day, and this place of which you said, My name shall be there, so that you will hear the prayer your servant prayers prays toward this place. Hear the supplication of your servant and of your people Israel when they pray toward this uh -oh. place. Hear from heaven your dwelling place, and when you hear, forgive. As for the foreigner who does not belong to your people Israel, but has come from a distant land because of your name, for they will hear of your great name and your mighty hand and your outstretched arm. When they come and pray toward this temple, then hear from heaven your dwelling place. Do whatever the foreigner asks of you, so that all the peoples of the earth may know that your name may know your name and fear you, as you do your own people Israel, and may know that this house I have built bears your name. And then from the New Testament, I'll be reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 6, verses 56 through 69. In the Pew Bibles, you may follow along on page 1659. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. He said this while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, This is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, Does this offend you? Then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of the Spirit and life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. He went on to say, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled them. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Today we are at the end of our series, In Love. The first week, the focus was on building one another up in love for the sake of the unity of the body of Christ. Last week, we focused on living in and giving thanks in love. And this week, the title is Move in Love, which to me is a bit of a confusing thing this morning. You see, sometimes when looking at the lectionary on the UMC website, They'll, they'll have a suggested series based on lectionary scriptures. For August, it was the In Love series based on Ephesians. The writers graciously provide worship ideas with song suggestions, often songs that we don't have in any of the books that we have here. And they also always include some type of preaching notes to let you know their train of thought for that week's installment. Sometimes I find these notes very useful. But others I do not find much in them that speaks to our parish. Before I start a suggested series, I will read over the themes to ensure that, that I'm comfortable using them, that I, that I feel that they communicate something to our parish. But at that point, I usually don't dig too deep into the details. And so we find ourselves this week with a sermon titled, Move in Love, with a scripture that doesn't have much to say in the way of movement. 
from Ephesians, the sixth chapter, the 10th through the 20th verses. You can follow along on page 1821. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the evil one, excuse me, the full armor of God so when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. Be strong. Put on. Take up. Pray. Not much in the way of movement there, but we'll get back to that. So, I have this picture. I have this picture of me and body armor while mobilized for, for enduring freedom. So, I know what it means to put on armor. 40 pounds of it. Now, this armor is a little bit different from the armor of Paul's day, as you might imagine. This is called IOTV. Complete with sappy plates. Now that IOTV, that's improved outer tactical vest. Sappy plates, they're, they're the finest you can get in ballistic protection for your insides. And you have molly webbing on the outside that you can attach all your combat needs. You know, grenade pouches, extra magazines, whatever. Sunglasses. And finally, it's protected by NGAR trademark. And it's resistant to odor, to microbes, fungi, mosquitoes, bed bugs, and color fading. And that's a standard issue Kevlar helmet right there. And that's not a sword I'm carrying, that's an M4. Now the people who normally wore armor in Paul's day were the Romans. They were the political and military power of the day. And at the time of Paul's writing, the believers were a very small minority in that empire. And the Romans weren't conducting a lot of defensive operations at this time. In fact, they had yet to achieve their farthest gains in territory. The empire was still expanding and in conquest mode. Yet Paul uses the metaphor of armor not to express a Christian offensive, but rather that armor is to be used in a defensive manner to protect the church. However, the first thing we see in our scripture this morning is that we are to be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. This is not about us or our abilities. It's about God and His power. In spiritual warfare, the battle is the Lord's. And at times, God has simply commanded the people to stand still and watch the Lord win a battle without any human help. Like in the 14th chapter of Exodus, and as Pharaoh drew near, the sons of Israel looked, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them. And they became very frightened. So the sons of Israel cried out to the Lord. Then they said to Moses, Is it because there were no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you dealt with us in this way, bringing us out of Egypt? Is this, is this not the word that we spoke to you in Egypt, saying, Leave us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would be better to have us serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. But Moses said to the people, do not fear. Stand by and see the salvation of the Lord, which we, he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you've seen today, you will never see them again forever. The Lord will fight for you while you keep silent. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. 
Now Paul seems to be talking about a bit more active a role than the Israelites had with the Egyptians. But the power is still God's. Because our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Here Paul cautions us against taking things out on people as if they were the real enemy. The real enemy is the rulers and the authorities and powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil that are found in the heavenly realm. Now the heavenly realm here isn't referring to heaven itself, but rather everything that isn't earth. You know, the physical, tangible world that we can see and touch. Brothers and sisters, Paul right here tells us that there's a war going on. A spiritual struggle that's been going on for thousands of years at least. Our adversary is Satan, the evil one. And we've seen evidence of this struggle throughout the Bible, beginning with the temptation of Eve in the Garden of Eden. On to Job and his struggles. The temptation of Jesus. Just to name a few of the Satan sightings in the Bible. And Satan's not alone. We know this from the, from the demons and the unclean spirits that Jesus and the apostles cast out through the Gospels and, and through Acts. But God has not left us defenseless. We've been given armor, and we've been told to put it all on. This language is reminiscent of the baptismal language earlier in Ephesians, when we were to put on the new self. The new self in the likeness of God and marked by love and unity, sealed by the Holy Spirit. We are to put on the armor so that we can stand our ground. Now, armor does nothing to the enemy directly, right? It's a defensive tool. It protects our most vital parts from the enemy. Paul tells us it's so that we can stand firm. Standing firm. The direct opposite of what Paul warns us against in chapter 4 from a couple weeks ago. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and, and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. So what's first on our armor list? A belt of truth. Why a belt? Well, in, in Roman days, they didn't wear pants. They had tunics, free-flowing, lots of airflow. But it would get tangled in your legs if you were in a fight. So they'd take the belt and they'd cinch that tunic. So it wouldn't become a hindrance or a danger in battle. So the donning of the belt was a signal that you were ready to enter that battle. And that it's a belt of truth is an example of how this battle will be fought. Not with brute force, but with character and with the power of the Lord. Then we have the, the breastplate of righteousness. And you know this isn't the first time that the armor of God has been referenced in the Bible. Isaiah, in a, in a prophecy of the Messiah, he talks about belts and breastplates. In talking about the Lord battling on behalf of Israel, he is said to put on righteousness as his breastplate and a helmet of salvation in pursuit of justice. And now God is giving this armor to us to protect us in a battle that he's already won. Because Jesus defeated Satan at the cross. Satan just hasn't received his final judgment yet. That will come when Jesus comes again. Another job for Jesus, not us. Paul goes from breastplate to feet. Feet which are fitted with readiness. And, and here Paul uses a phrase that's unique in the Bible. But he says this readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. This reference to the gospel of peace seems to draw on Isaiah 52, 7, in which the one who bears the gospel of peace is a messenger, as we all should be messengers of the love of Jesus Christ. How lovely on the mountains are the feet of them who bring good news, proclaiming peace, announcing news of happiness. Our God reigns. And then we are to take up the shield of faith. Paul tells us that we can use it to extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. Does that seem odd to anyone else? A shield to extinguish the flames of arrows? I did some research. And it turns out that some of those shields that the old Romans used, they would have overlapping layers of leather. 
and they would soak the leather in water. So when the arrows would hit, they'd fall and they'd be able to extinguish the arrow just by pressing down with their wet shield. Satan will take pot shots at us whenever he can. But they don't have to be effective against us. If we have the shield of faith, and we keep our faith strong. Now to finish out our armor, we have the helmet of salvation. The helmet which protects our most vulnerable and important part of our body. It typically goes on last. You know, just, just before you leave that fortified position that you're in. And none of this John Wayne stuff. Does anybody know what I'm talking about, this John Wayne stuff, right? Who's seen a John Wayne military movie? Strap hanging down, helmet not set on the head right, you know. You can't expect the helmet to stay on and do its job if you just toss it on your melon and let it bob around. you got to strap it on good, just like the rest of your armor. That way it can move with you and protect you. And after all this defensive equipment that we've been fitted with, and, and the Lord knows our sizes, we come to the last piece. The sword of the Spirit. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now there are a couple of Greek terms which are translated into English as word. There's logos, which means the expression of a thought. And it's the word that is used to describe Jesus as the word, capitalized, of God. Though it's also used to refer to written messages of God. But the Greek word used here is rhema, which refers to the actual spoken or written words of God. When Jesus was tempted by Satan, he answered, Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word, rhema, that proceeds from the mouth of God. Jesus demonstrated that we can use the actual recorded words of God to overcome Satan's attacks. So maybe we should be memorizing more words of God. Now the phrase word of God means more than the printed words on a page, because God is a communicator. And he's been speaking into the human realm since the beginning. He speaks through his creation, through ancient prophets, through the Holy Spirit, through Scripture, and through the person of his Son, Jesus Christ. We can learn to know God better by seeking to hear him in every way that he speaks. Then when we find ourselves engaged in a skirmish of the greater war, we will have a weapon to fight back with. I'm reminded of a particular Congressional Medal of Honor awardee by the name of Sammy Davis. Yes, Sammy Davis. He served during Vietnam, and man, did he get a lot of grief for a name that was so similar to a certain black Jewish entertainer. But it did also provide him with a bit of notoriety. Sammy tells a story about his sergeant, a story that I got to hear firsthand. And Sammy thought he had the meanest sergeant there was because of the stuff that he would make his troops do during the downtime. And if any, and anybody who served in the military knows that there's a lot of hurry up and wait, right? Hours, days, perhaps even weeks of relative inactivity, and then a burst of intense action followed by more inactivity. Hurry up and wait. Well, one of the things that this sergeant had his men doing was polish bullets. There in the jungles of Vietnam, in the heat, in the moist, they were polishing bullets, and, and not only bullets for the M16, because Sammy was an artilleryman. So he had big bullets for his big guns too, right? And he just didn't understand the point of polishing these bullets. And one day his, his sergeant explained it to him. He said that they're part of your weapon. And the cleaner your weapon is, the better maintained it is, the more effective and reliable it's going to be in battle. Cleaning a bullet now might mean no jam later when it matters, when the enemy is closing in on it. So how are we maintaining our weapon, our sword of the Spirit, the Word of God? Are we studying every day? Are we memorizing the words of God so that we can be like Jesus and, and have a rebuttal for every attack that the devil and his cronies throw our way? So now you can consider me your mean sergeant. Start polishing your sword. 
You know that Sammy was kind of notable for his, among his peers for his name, but, and he was certainly notable for his actions which led to the Medal of Honor. But that Medal of Honor led to another distinction and even more notoriety for Sammy. I'm guessing that many of you actually know some of Sammy's story already, even beyond what I just told you. And I think, I think maybe most of you have actually seen Sammy, or at least parts of him. Because Sammy's other claim to fame, he's the real Forrest Gump. Who's seen the movie Forrest Gump? When Forrest Gump gets his Medal of Honor, they just superimpose Tom Hanks' head on Sammy Davis's body. That was him getting the Congressional Medal of Honor. They also borrowed from Sammy's citation for his Medal of Honor for Forrest's. But Sammy's was more interesting. Both of those citations involve <coughs> movement. I told you to get back to that. You see, beyond the movement involved in, in putting on the armor and taking a stand, it's the movement that we do to help one another. Forrest and Sammy both moved with weapons and armor that they had to save their fellow soldiers on the battlefield. They sought out the wounded and injured and carried them away to, to relatives safely from the enemy battle lines where they could be tended to. And we need to do that for one another. We need to do that for our community. There are many wounded out there who need a place to heal. And we who are tasked with building each other up and, and living in love are uniquely suited to be that place of healing. We can be the Sammy Davises of our community. So let us prepare and move into, into hostile territory with our defenses in place in order to save as, as many as we can, relying not on our strength, but on God's strength. And finally, we need to remember to pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests always praying for the Lord's people. And I'll put myself in the position of Paul here. Pray for me. Pray for me that I get the message from the Lord that he wants you to have and that I am never too afraid to speak it to you. And now, will you pray with me for all of us? Lord God, I thank you for the message this week. I thank you for the armor that you give us to defend ourselves from the enemy's weapons, from the enemy's schemes, from all the things that, that he does to trip us up, make us doubt ourselves. Lord, I ask that you help us to maintain our, our shield of faith I ask that you help us keep our, our sword of the Spirit sharp so that we can rebut the devil's attacks. And Lord, I ask that you help us to move in love, fully armored, to go out on the battlefield and rescue those who are wounded. To bring the love of Jesus Christ into their lives. Bring them to a place where they can recover. Amongst loving people who will build them up in that love. And we thank you for these things in Jesus' precious name. stand and join together number 670 go forth for God
Now is the time to bring our praise and petitions before the Lord. Uh, we received prayer requests for Carol Streeby, for Ashley Williams, and for the family of Senator McCain. Do we have anything else to add to our praise and petitions this morning? I'd like to ask for prayers for Patty Crest. She leaves Thursday to do a pilgrimage of 500 miles in Spain. It's a Catholic pilgrimage, and she and Pat Davis are going to do that. It's going to take them about six weeks. So we just keep them in our prayers. Yeah, that's the, um, the Santiago um, the, uh, Camino. Camino Santiago, um, and if you want to kind of see somebody's fictional personal experience of it, you can watch the movie. Uh. Anybody else? Any worries about Mary Lynn? No significant changes there. <coughs> We're still working with her in rehab. Um, sorry, this week we won't run. So and she's in good spirit. So. All right. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Gracious God, we have so much to give you praise for. Many things that we don't even know or that we are aware of that you do for us. But Lord, we do want to especially give you praise this morning for Blake's progress that he woke up. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, there are many, many on our list this morning who need healing. We know that by Jesus' stripes that we can be healed. We know you have the power. We ask that if it be your will, you bring healing to June, to Mary Lynn, to Judy, to Carol, and to Ashley. Hey. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. And Lord, you know, you know, Meryl. You have contact with him. When others don't seem to be able to connect with him. We know that you can. And Lord, we ask that you give Meryl what's best for him. And we pray for his peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Lord, there are many, there are many families dealing with loss, the loss of loved ones. We ask that you give them comfort, courage, and the peace that passes understanding for the families of Jen, and of Pam, and of John. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Lord, we are still in, in back to school time period for this week and the, and the coming weeks. We ask your hand to be upon the students, the teachers, the staff, and faculty. Lord, we ask that you let Jesus be seen in your people that work and attend these schools. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, this week we talked about the unity of the body of Christ and how we are to seek that. Lord, the, one of the smaller components of that unity of Christ is the family that is Christian and that tries to follow you. The Lord, I know of a couple families that are that are struggling with that unity right now. And Lord, we invite your spirit in to, to help them focus upon you. Putting God first, everything else will, will fall into place for them. We ask that you help them achieve unity in their families and in the body of Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And 
Finally, Lord, for the vulnerable, for those unable to speak to them, speak for themselves, whether it be due to poverty or disability, location, prejudice. Lord, I ask that you give us eyes to see them, ears to hear them, tongues to speak on their behalf, and hands and feet to move for them or move to them, bringing your love to them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we are thankful that we can bring our praise and petitions before you, and, and now we, we come to you with the prayer taught to us by your Son, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This time I invite the ushers to come forward.
receive the blessing. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit, as you walk in the footsteps of our Lord Jesus Christ, ministering to all you need. Amen. Amen.